Mary Atheist Miss. I am Phineas 12 Gage. This is the Apostate Seminary. And in this episode, we're considering the closing salvos in the war on Christmas. Because as Christmas season begins to wind down and we evaluate the damage done, it behooves us to th- sit back and think about and examine how and why it started, who started it, and what Tucker Carlson's deal actually is. I started becoming aware of the idea of the war on Christmas when I was an elder teenager. And that was also when I started the deconversion process, and I was kind of being a real piece of shit about everything, especially martyr martyr complexes. At this time, the DC talk song Jesus Freak had been out for a little over a decade, and it had been bothering me that it included the line, what would people think if they hear that I'm a Jesus Freak? What will people do when they find out it's true? And the song came out in America. Like, I couldn't see that. At the time, the way I saw the world, I could see Christians being persecuted in Iran, or Pakistan, but in America? Were we having God we trust on our money? Where they made me pledge allegiance to a flag under God through the elementary school? What would people think when people think that you're just like everyone else? And that's similar to how I felt about Christmas. When I started becoming aware of it, it didn't make any sense. Who was declaring war on Christmas? How many atheists are there? Where do they get this power? How do you ban Christmas? Can't we all just do Christmas quieter? If there's so much oppression of Christmas, how come there's so much Christmas everywhere all the time? There's Christmas Santa in the mall. There's Christmas in the stores. There's Christmas in the stores before Halloween. There's Christmas everywhere. And then I started doing this podcast. And in the course of doing this podcast, I decided I'm going to do an episode. I'm going to release it on Christmas instead of Sunday. And I'm going to do the thing that all podcasts do, where it's the same episode, but everybody tries to find kind of a different way to do it. So I'm looking into the history of Christmas and trying to come up with something that isn't talked about very much, and accidentally debunking Santa slapping that guy at the Council of Nicaea, finding out some interesting stuff, and then finding out that their war on Christmas has been going on for 400 years. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that as the war on Christmas winds down and comes to a close this year and we move on to replenish ourselves and restock on candy cane munitions and sugar plums dance in our dreams of slaying our most festive of enemies. And like all weird shit 400 years ago, we're going to start in England. So the way to think of England at the time in our context was you had the Church of England, you had the Puritans, and you had the Catholics. And the Puritans are people who, when Henry VIII reformed Christianity and created the Church of England, it was still way too Catholic for their tastes. Now, at this time, the Puritans are not the same as the Pilgrims, although now we use the terms interchangeably due to the fact that the two groups did come together. But when they started, they were both against what the Church of England was allowing. The difference is that the pilgrims were separatists and the Puritans just wanted the religious freedom to be able to take over the state church and have it worship their way and have their brand of Christianity run things. And for both groups, this involved being against Christmas because they were running off of a hyper-literal biblical interpretation that kind of still fucks us over to this day. See, the Christmas tradition at this point had become to go to church, sing carols, drink wassail, and not shopping because businesses were closed on this month, the commemoration of your Savior's birth, and that could not stand. Well, I mean, that and the the getting drunk and the dancing and the fucking and the fighting. Because Christmas used to be a lot more awesome. But the Puritans were the asshole who walks around at Christmas telling you that Christmas trees are expressly forbidden in the Bible, and it doesn't even say to celebrate Jesus' birthday and kind of implies the opposite sometimes. And it's a pagan holiday anyway, and he would have been born closer to Easter and bab and boo. And if that's you, it's exhausting, and you should just drink the fucking cider, open a fucking gift, and hail Santa when everyone says amen. Or go the other route, full puritanical, and show up screaming how you have to ban the merrymaking. They first made this attempt with the Westminster Confession of Faith in 1647, and that provided a kind of rulebook on how Puritans should worship and live. It was like a GQ style guide for your grandpa that makes your cousins memorize the Bible. Pilgrims, meanwhile, went to Holland to duck from what was going on in England with the church, and in 1620 left for America. But before we get to America, we should wrap up England. In 1657, it was made illegal to close businesses or attend or hold a Christmas worship service. 
This seems like a really extreme measure, and when Oliver Cromwell was knocked out of power and the monarchy was restored in 1660, so was Christmas. And so the first war on Christmas was lost, and we kept the holiday around in England. But in America, there's no better way to introduce what was going on than was done by the Salisbury Historical Society. The headliner in the article was, How Did the First Settlers Celebrate Christmas? And the first sentence is, They didn't. When the Pilgrims got to America, they stayed in Massachusetts and were eventually absorbed by the Puritans. And in 1659, Christmas was literally made illegal in the American colonies. And that's a move that's in line with the Westminster Confession. Before that, it was just taboo. It stayed that way until 1686. Sir Edmund Andros had a Christmas Day service. Due to the way that the Puritans had been behaving towards Christmas, and I assume the general murderiness of the British, he apparently went to sing Christmas hymns and decided he needed to be surrounded by British soldiers for protection, which, given the time period, he may have been. Then less than 30 years later, in 1712, Cotton Mather, a big deal in New England religiosity, told his congregation, quote, The feast of Christ's nativity is spent in reveling, dicing, carding, masking, and in all licentious liberty, by mad mirth, by long eating, by hard drinking, by lewd gaming, and rude reveling, end quote. After this, we nearly got rid of Christmas again as part of the revolution. This was on a little bit of a larger scale. You see, Christmas wasn't made a federal holiday until 1870 by a noted president and man otherwise known for stomping a mud hole into the Confederate's ass and walking it dry, Ulysses S. Grant. During the Civil War in the Union and the Confederacy had both men celebrating Christmas. They both wanted a victory for Christmas, but Santa didn't want competition for slavery-based production. Before that, it was seen as an English thing a vestige of hard feelings about the way that religion had been going and something that caused the schism between the Church of England and the Pilgrims and Puritans that settled America and Congress had been assembling on Christmas. It was done in 1797 and 1802 because the American government was on the front lines of the war on Christmas. And as late as 1850, schools and stores were still open on Christmas, with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, known as the guy who wrote that awful poem about Paul Revere, remarking, quote, the old Puritan feeling prevents it from being a cheerful, hearty holiday, though every year makes it more so, end quote. And that's kind of the end of the interesting stuff until the 1930s, because during the 30s and 40s, the Christian, atheist, Catholic, Protestant, anti-Semitic, Jew-run, fascist, communist, depending on who you ask Nazis, attempted to apply the downright evil and definitely anti-Semitic fascist views of the Reich to Christmas. This presented a pretty Nazi-centric issue, for the Fuhrer, Germany was a very Christian country, and a lot of the traditions we have in America came out of Germany, where everyone worshipped Jesus, the Jew, the bad guy, according to the Nazi regime. So how would they turn Christmas into a Nazi propaganda fest? Hymns was part of it, and part of bringing this up is that I found the lyrics to Nazi Silent Night, and I am not going to find that, know it, and keep it to myself. The translated lyrics of a couple of verses of To Nazi Silent Night, which is called Enlightened Night, are as follows. Silent night, holy night, all are sleeping, alone and awake. Only the Chancellor Hitler, faithfully alert, keeps watch of Germany's prosperity well, always mindful of us. Silent night, holy night, all are sleeping, alone and awake. Adolf Hitler is Germany's fate, lead us to greatness, fame and fortune, give us Germans the power. I know the accent was probably unnecessary, but I don't really do voices on this show, and it's kind of fun sometimes. The communists were also trying to reform Christmas around this time, and that's a, a thing that I didn't have the time to get into. But th they also rewrote Silent Night, and I, I found that. Um, I'm not even going to try a Russian accent. It's just hard consonants. Uh... But the verses were things like, Silent night, holy night, Christmas tree switched on, and a sweet little song sung, and a glass of eggnog drunk, and children beaten till they are handsomely devout, and cheap night, hurried night, installment plans made easy by the angels alleluia. They belong to the advertising budget because our father in heaven is president of the corporation. They belong to the advertising budget because our father in heaven is president of the corporation is a pretty good anti-capitalist verse. In addition to this, the children of Hitler's youth and the band of German girls would go about giving coats and money to poor people who belonged to the party so that we could demonize social programs for generations. 
And a big part of the war on Christmas was trying to replace Santa with Wotan, the Germanic god that became Odin and was part of Nazi mythology, as well as mythologies that are more fitting to the way Odin behaves in the myths, which is a way that would not be a big fan, probably, of that group uh, in the Midwest opening up the white supremacist church in Missouri, I think. And by this time, uh, America had firmly changed its position on Christmas, keeping in mind that when World War II ended, Christmas had been recognized as a holiday for 75 years. So in the 1930s, the war on Christmas, ushering in that American golden age of continuing to have it great to be white, but also selling more train sets, I guess, ended with Hitler killing himself in a bunker in a desperate move to avoid facing consequences for orchestrating the extermination of Jews and Santa Claus. This took America to, to the 50s and 60s, which is where we start seeing a lot more religiosity in government, starting up to the events that'll give us Reagan, as we've talked about previously, and it gives us the modern Christmas that we recognize now. It gives us the Christmas with Coca-Cola and a jolly man in a red suit. It gives us the Christmas with trees and ornaments and decorations and fruitcake and little guys running around playing with train sets and little girls running around also playing with train sets because fuck your gender roles 1950s america and all was well the end or well not really of course T today uh, the war on christmas mainly takes the form of not injecting jesus into everything whether it makes sense or not that's the main battle that we're fighting i really like how history.com puts it Quote, it also fired up several cable news hosts such as Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity, both of whom many believe took charge of the modern day war on Christmas and made it a grassroots campaign. End quote. And that's a phenomenal way to say Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity got people all riled up about some stupid nonsense, silly bullshit that used to actually be a thing. The more or less silly nonsense uh, modern war on Christmas, has also been called a hate crime by Pat Buchanan, has been declared a move toward a godless America, like you know, happened when it was a literal crime uh, by friend of the show Jerry Falwell, and Donald Trump promised to make it okay to say Merry Christmas again, which is great because that was a weird June where we weren't saying Merry Christmas, but he said we could again. To back up, in 2005, a book came out that is 100% on my to-read list called The War on Christmas, How the Liberal Plot to Ban the Sacred Christian Holiday is Worse Than You Thought. That book was by John Gibson. But John Gibson is kind of secondary to this part of the story. The important part is Dan Casino. He's a political scientist and analyst who traces the modern war on Christmas in America to October 2005, with Gibson being on the O'Reilly factor. See, America, being a wildly out-of-control capitalist country, lets people go on shows and talk about shit they made up. So John Gibson was given a huge platform on what was Fox News' biggest show at the time, to say that if you don't say Merry Christmas, the libs will get rid of Christmas, and quote, then you can pass secular progressive programs like legalization of narcotics, euthanasia, abortion at will, and gay marriage, and quote, every time a supermarket checker or store clerk greets you with happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, you have met another soldier in the war on Christmas. So that's kind of the intellectual playing field we're on. Somewhere between if the state doesn't stop people from being gay, we can't hate them. And if you let people be gay and married, they'll fuck cows in a nativity scene while committing eugenics and having abortions. But during the years, it began to shift the other direction. CNN wrote an article in 2012 that says, I'm sure much to Jerry Falwell's chagrin, that some liberals are starting to view the Republicans as the party of the Grinch. See, to the conservative right, the godless liberals, want to destroy everything about Jesus and Christianity. Personally, I'm not particularly bothered by Jesus or Christianity as long as it isn't being used to legislate people's lives and the adherents don't use their belief to abuse people about it. But because of this, the, the evangelical Christian is the best soldier that the godless secular left has. They're ruining Christmas for Christians, which is sad. I mean, hashtag not all Christians, whatever, but there are people out there who are worried that the left is trying to get rid of Christianity by getting rid of Christmas. That has to make Christmas at the least a very stressy time of year. On top of all the other stresses, 
the buying presents and the stress of trying to relax and enjoy being around your family before, you know, Uncle Frank gets a little eggnoggy and starts screaming about the Fed. Before somebody brings up religion, before you take my advice and say, Hail Santa, when everyone else says amen, they, on top of all of that, also have to worry about fighting against the atheist liberal establishment that just put a Catholic in the White House? It doesn't seem to exist. But that does give a couple things to think about, something that really doesn't bother me too much on account of I'm on the winning side on this one. On the one hand, when you acknowledge Hanukkah, Bill O'Reilly gets sad, and so pretty worth it. On the other hand, though, when I drink my devil mint Moloch sacrifice out of my Satan Bucks goblet, it makes Jerry Falwell sad. And that's also worth it. Because if they're going to be silly and spend their Christmas being terrified that their Puritan ancestors are teaming up with atheists and are coming for their Christmas, I say fucking let them. Especially when this year they've added to it. They added to it because not only are we trying to take away Christmas, we started COVID to take away Christmas. See, we couldn't take away their economy. We couldn't take away their summer. We couldn't take away their Thanksgiving with our silly attempts to try and save them from horrible, horrible death or defect. And we're not going to be able to save them with the vaccine. Because it's all just to take away Christmas and kill baby Jesus. Because... When you hear the war on Christmas, what you should think is people who will come up with literally any reason to justify why they aren't allowed to have nice things, instead of just being not the reason the rest of us can't have nice things. And that's a wholesome thought, because in the end, isn't that what the war on Christmas is all about? That is the first Christmas of the Apostate Seminary. The store will be in the show notes. I will be launching a Patreon soon. I apologize. The episode came out later than I wanted to and was shorter. I'm adjusting to a new mental health medication. So things are a little weird. I will keep on an every other week schedule. And I will be going up to back to weekly as soon as I have uh, my dosages right. So I have been Phineas 12 Gage. As always, if you want to support the show, the best thing you can do is tell your friends and share it on social media. Pick your favorite episode, put it out there. It'll bring in more listeners a lot more than reviews. When you leave a review, you're leaving a review in a sea of thousands, millions of podcast reviews. So the impact is much bigger when you say, hey, you've been thinking about deconverting. This guy very crassly looks at religion. Maybe give it a shot. So... With that being said, I thank you for listening. I thank you for your time and attention. Happy holidays. Be safe.